do not feel like any question is a bad question or wrong questions, but we would love to just hear from you. And if we have another mic that we can pass along throughout the audience, that would be great. But if not, then we'll just ask people to just speak a little louder, or Mona will help us, so that you all can state your question. Um, if you don't remember the panelist's name, just ask, and so we'll have each panelist hopefully get one of your questions today. Hello, good afternoon. What's your name? My name is Jason Turner. Uh, my question is uh, going to everybody, the whole panel actually. Um, my question would be this. Why do industries feel that it's important to label uh, a specific person or someone going through something that might not go with what everybody else is doing? <clears throat> Give me an example. Um, let's say a person may be very you know, quiet, reserved to themselves, not really that sociable, but they don't really have any necessary issues or problems. Why is it that if a person does that, from the outside looking in, everybody assumes that something has to be wrong with this person, that, that there's no way they can fully function through this and not be depressed or not be like, why does it have to be a label? It almost reminds me of when we talk about God. The only reason why we give God a label of God is because we can't really explain what we're trying to explain about what all that God does. So we have to put a title to it and put it in a box so that way we can identify it. That's the only way that we can do it. Why do us as humans do we feel like we have to title and put things into a category in order for us to make sense of it? That's a great question. That's a great whole question. panel. So let's start with Lindsay and just one at a time answer that question. Do we need my question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk loud. There you go. Um, so I think that question when you say why do we have to put a name on things, I think that, that when we look at the history of me medicine and we look at the history of humanity, that that's a very new thing in terms of um, Western thought and in terms of African descendant indigenous people being in this country or, or in this cultural climate. Um, that, that idea of naming things and putting things into different kinds of boxes is not um, is a relatively new way of being in the world. You know, we look back on thousands of years of humanity. Um, and so my, my first thing would be that part of that can be useful because the languaging, I think, is important. So for me to know, okay, this is depression, or these thoughts are not serving me, even being able to separate and categorize, okay, this is a thought or an idea or a feeling that is serving me and bringing me forward in my life, or, okay, that's an insecure thought. That's an underconfident thought. That's not really who I am. So I think the languaging there can be helpful and useful. Um, but then I also think that, um, you know, we can also bring a perspective to this work that says, well, however I'm here is, this is my gift. However I'm showing up, this is who I am, this is my gift. I am this way for a reason. So if I'm introverted and I maybe listen a little bit more, that's part of my gift. If I'm extroverted and I can turn it up a little bit more, that's part of my gift too. And part of the work that, um, in, in my opinion, that mental health work is about is looking at a person as an individual and saying, however they're expressing themselves, however they're showing up, is it serving them? Is it helping to get to where they want to be? Is, is the trauma or the experience or the joy, is it useful? Is it helping them to fulfill their purpose in the world so that we collectively can create a different world? And so. Um, that's how I would answer both parts of that question. And with labeling, you have to be very careful because once you label somebody, it comes to stigmatism. Yeah, that goes with Absolutely. it. And the person, well, you know, the person who have a mental disability, so they are they're different. It's just that people need to take the understanding to say that see that person is a human being, not that they have a mental disability that they can't interact. And with our African American children, we have to be very careful. When they go to a classroom and they're not sit, they sit, they not, they, they just keep on moving. We have to make sure that people don't live them call them a, I mean, attention hyperactive deficit disorder because they may just need to be a little bit more challenged. Mm -hmm. So you know, we tend to get our children labeled that way too, and nothing is absolutely wrong with them. Mm -hmm. So Nikita, let's get Nikita. So, so I disagree. Um, everybody sees the label, nobody sees the benefit. Mm -hmm. So when, um, since she brought up ADHD, I have a patient in my office right now who I've had an extensive conversation with, with her mother about the possibility of her having ADD. Mm -hmm. Now, white people pay 
for an ADD diagnosis. And let me tell you why they pay for it. Then you take a perfectly healthy child, take him to a psychotherapist and says, he can't focus, he needs ADD. He has ADD. And the doctor will write a script for him for medication. You know why? Because that medication helps him focus better. And he gets an individualized IEP plan. And with that IEP plan, that means he gets longer to take his SATs. He gets longer to take his um, ACTs. So he is on a, a, a positive track to get into the college that he wants to get into just because he has that diagnosis. So where some of us see stigma, we don't see benefits. So that's the first thing. I approach my practice as I approach going into any room. When I go into a room, I scan the room and then I focus. So what a diagnosis is, a diagnosis is me scanning the room of what the possibility the problem may be and then me focusing in on this person and finding out whether this person has this, that, or look at the totality of their experience and see if that goes in with the diagnosis. And I get paid from insurance companies. And the insurance company ain't going to pay me if I don't label it. If I don't say this is what it is and this that is what it is. So labeling can be helpful in order to treat. I can't treat what I don't know what is. And so I, I kind of have to look at certain things. With my, my mechanic labeled my car. It wouldn't start the other day. It was cutting off. He fixed this and then that didn't fix it. Then he fixed that. So this is all it is we're practicing. And I also disagree respectfully. Mm -hmm. Chakras. Mm -hmm. There are eight chakras. And when you go on, you learning, I'm just, it's an eight, seven, nine. I'm just learning. Mm -hmm. I'm learning. Well. <laughs> it's chakras. It's, it, mm -hmm. And it, each one of them focuses on, on each different energy centers of the body. And so you have to label it in order to find out what it is. So labels, just like language, is nothing but focus. And we have to start thinking about how we look at things. When I, when I thought I had depression, I had dysthymia. Dysthymia is like depression, but it's not the same. I was okay with having a label because I knew what it was. It wasn't that I was lazy. It wasn't that I was, was sick. It wasn't that I, I didn't have motivation. It wasn't that. It was something really truly wrong with me. So don't you think that mentally, once you get a diagnosis from somebody who's supposed to be an expert, right? Now, honestly, you can easily, a doctor can easily make a mistake on this diagnosis. And it could be, like you said, something like depression. It, it's very similar. You understand? But, I understand what you're saying. Let me just intercede because we're going to have time just for two more questions before we wrap up. And I do understand what you're saying. And what the three of you have answered thus far is this. Each practitioner, if a person makes it into a practitioner's office, That's a good thing. then they're looking at this person through their lens. They go to another practitioner, that practitioner's looking at it through their lens. Five different practitioners can have five different diagnoses. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cultural competency is everything. Is very important. Mm -hmm. It's different from me going to see someone who has no idea of my background, socioeconomic status, my history, and says, that's schizophrenia. Somebody else goes and says, she's of African descent, that might be a different thing. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? We're talking about cultural competency mm -hmm. and people's equipment to do their job effectively. Mm -hmm. What this sister said, Lindsay, is what we're talking about in regards to labeling something for the, for the sole purpose of understanding it as treatment, yes. we can't treat, and Nikita said this too, what we don't know. So there's a, there's a course of treatment with each diagnosis. But when we're talking about the average person isolating a day or two, or they don't want to socialize, or what have you, that's not technically abnormal. Right. Okay. What we're speaking to is when does a behavior or a cluster of behaviors impact that person's ability to communicate, go to work, school, eat, bathe, dress themselves, become employable. Do you understand the difference? We're not saying everything that a person sees as being a human being with a personality is impacted strictly by something being mentally wrong with them. We're saying when it impacts those areas of your life, then it becomes problematic and that's where labeling and putting diagnoses to it is important. So for that, we'll, we'll pick back up after because we have two other people that have questions and we want to be able to address it. I know we don't have a lot of time. So if you don't mind just saving your name can and I just say one, Can I just say one more thing? Uh, a label is, the label does not mean you have to stick, it's not a stigma. A label is not a stigma. And that's, we have to remove, our, we got to get out of that mindset. It's not a stigma. 
What's your name, brother? My name is Dominic. I'm from Bronx Community College. I don't know. Uh, it's Can I say one more thing? Uh, a label is the label does not mean you have to stick. It's not a stigma. A label is not a stigma, and that's we have to remove. Our, we got to get out of that mindset. It's not a stigma. Okay, brother. My name is Dominic. I'm from Bronx Community College. I teach uh, middle school uh, social secu uh, social entrepreneurship to middle schoolers, but I also started my own company. It's called Donald Ventures. It's basically like a, a small venture capitalist to help others. Once with the, the company, that, the event or the, the way that I want to make money is by providing a space for people to, it's called Triple R's, or Reflect. Tell us your question now. I'm sorry. Basically, well, it's called Reflect, Recuperate, and Relax, Reflect, and Recuperate. So she said she brought 80 men together, or 80 women together. Or a group together, yeah. uh, and I'm not a yoga. It's not yoga, but it's a place where people can like breathe and relax and just really just take their mind off. It's like a quiet place. I just wanted to know if like is that is there is that a good place to start to tackle mental health? Like you know how people have a house and they can't get away. I, I basically want to give young people like millennials and people in my, my college a place that they can go from all of this stuff. That, so his question is, is, is that a good start? Yeah, yeah, it's where you are, basically a good place to help people receive the service. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a master personal trainer that's obsessed with love. I love love. I love love between parents. I love love between, you know, men. I, I love love on all levels. This is why I wrote this book. I'm obsessed with love. I, I don't have any degrees in love. I'm a trainer. I'm a business, you know, owner, and I'm an entrepreneur. But with my thoughts and what I feel in my heart. I'm that passionate about it. I wrote a book about it. I did an event at Milk River and just called people, asked Mona. I was like, you know, so it doesn't really matter where you, what were you going to say? You came to Bronx Community College. I'm sure did. With, uh, Amadeus. with Amadeus, yes. You were a trainer. Yeah, so you see, and, 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 and just, just the fact that you remembered me, yeah. right, shows that I'm doing what I got to do no matter what my, no matter who I am. You know what I'm saying? I get out there. I talk to people. I bring people together. I'm, I don't have a publicist. I, all this accolades that I've gotten, I've gotten because I've opened my mouth. Mm -hmm. I tell people this is what I am. You know what Lindsay said to me when she met me? Girl, your PR game is good. Because I, <laughs> hey, I'm Nicole Chapman. How are you? You know, you're gonna remember me today. Everybody's gonna go on my Snapchat. You're gonna remember this girl. You're like, this girl's wild. You know what I mean? But it just shows you that start where you are. Somebody might go home today and be like, her energy was positive. That might affect, like, that's what I said earlier. It doesn't, you don't have to do something on such a grand scale and think that it's not productive. If it matters to you, then it matters. You know what I'm saying? If it, it just, just the fact that it matters to you that you want to bring people together and have something that you could give back, doesn't matter if your budget's huge or whatever, it's something that you want to do, and that alone, you're going to be blessed by it. Someone's going to take from it, and, they're gonna, and, and then here we go, the domino effect. You know what I'm saying? And that's the whole point of us being here is that we should all leave here and somebody should be blessed by us being here. That's what I think our purpose is. Mm -hmm. We have time for just one more question. Mona, you have the mic? Okay. Tell us your name and what's your question? Hi, my name is Jakia King. I'm a clinical psychology doctoral student. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so, my issue is like, so right now I'm doing externship and I'm doing the whole thing every year. And um, sometimes my clients come in and they're depressed, they're suffering from anxiety and things like that. And they're already in the room, so that's great, they're getting the help that they need. But I'm wondering, like, with this whole hip hop culture now, like, depression and anxiety is almost being normalized to the point where it's just like everybody's suffering from it. People <coughs> can feel sadness. They're not able to tolerate these negative emotions that we may feel like on a regular basis. I don't know if that makes sense. If that makes sense. Yeah. So like like future is always talking about popping these pills, and then there's this yeah. kid who's talking about some of those bring it out now, like on the radio, there's these songs. And it's like everybody's like, yeah, oh you know, I'm gonna kill myself. And it's like a like a normal thing. Sure. Like, it's like yeah. that's something that is it's it's something that is diagnosed with and needs to be treated, but it's like it's like normal. So it's like these people are acknowledging that they have these issues, but they're not seeking the services. Mm -hmm. So how do you encourage people, especially young black children, <coughs> to actually seek these services? You know what I mean? It's like I feel like that's we have we used to have stigma and there's still a stigma there about mental health. But I think the issue is now seeking the services 
and then actually having access to the services. Yeah. And having access to services with people who look like you because I'm the only black person in my program. Mm -hmm. And these white kids are going out there and they're ready to treat black kids and they don't understand simple things or like they don't even have black friends. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to know like how do you feel like um I think by doing what you're doing, right? You're 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 adding your name to the field. Mm -hmm. So um it's I worked for a company few years ago, I worked for a company who I was like one of the only black clinicians and we were in public schools providing mental health therapy to children. And my two colleagues, my three colleagues, they were white. They weren't, they didn't look like me. Um, my principal was black. My, my students were black. We were in the hood. And so it was just me. Um, when I left that company, I ended up going, not really knowing where I was going to go. My black colleague in the school sent me to a black there a bunch of black therapists so that I can get my next license. Once they helped me get my license, they gave me space to go into practice. In that space that I'm in, I am, it's two black male therapists who own the building, who gave me my space to have my practice, who only hire us. So what we have to do is we have to create spaces mm -hmm. for us. I, it is my preference to treat black people. Am I going to get rich for it? I don't know. But my goal is to provide a space for black clinicians just like they did for me. My niece is a black mental health clinician. So my, my nephew wants to be a mental health clinician. So just kind of doing the work ex by existing in the space that you're existing in and, and dedicating a part of your practice to this work. And having these conversations in your family, in your my family is all in my inbox. I'm like the family therapist all of a sudden. Like, y'all can't pay me. So, but you know, just having those conversations is important. I want to add to that as well. I want to say that um, that what you're passionate about in terms of the communities that you want to service, like once you have those degrees, those letters, once you are like licensed <laughs> to practice then what you do with that is up to you. And if there are communities that you are concerned about, invested in, like you said, if you're if you're the one person in the room that can see what's happening in hip-hop culture, then that's how you start positioning yourself as a professional. You go to those places where um, those dialogues are happening, even if they're not talking about mental health. And you put yourself there and you make yourself part of the voice of that dialogue and I think that that's part of our responsibility as practitioners too is there's an African problem for it that says go back and fetch it. So mm. you're going to learn one thing in school, you're going to learn how to practice and you know we used to say in acupuncture school you learn enough not to kill somebody yes. <laughs> and then everything else that you're passionate about that you care about for myself that's indigenous culture, context, you know history. I add that into the practice and I make it my own so that I can reach the people that I care about so that I can reach the people that I want to that I want to reach and so that's the charge it's like you go you get what you need to do to do what you need to do and then you add on because we're so much more than that mm -hmm. so this not a, oh, I'm sorry just, just, please just say, say one more thing that we okay. gotta you, the, the, the reason why this is so passionate to me because it's like like the, the Percocet and the popping mollies and all yeah. of this stuff and and hip-hop I'm not saying all of it but a lot of it is glorifying the drugs and something like that like back in the day when Rakim was out and when Ella Kuti was out nobody was promoting, you know, popping mollies, you know what I'm saying? So what, what you could do on your own level is like, I don't, I put a lot of music on my videos, you know what I mean? And it might not affect a lot of people, but what I will do, I'm not going to put masks on, you know what I'm saying? Because kids do follow me. That's, you're responsible, and you're a responsible person, you could be responsible for what you can do. So that little thing, I'm not hating future, I wish him the best, but I'm not going to be promoting pop mollies, mask off you know, Percocet, you know what I'm saying? Because somebody might see that and be like, oh, well, Nicole's doing it, you know what I mean? She's hip hop, she's fitness, and she's popping minds. I'm not popping minds, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not gonna be out there promoting that on my page. Mm -hmm. So the little things like that, yeah. it, and, you know, and I'm not dissing him again, but that's not the lane that I'm choosing to go through. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Let's thank our panel. Our yeah. Yeah. Nicole, Captain, the Yes. Again, thank you for coming to the checkup. Our next panel will begin shortly. We have one in the next room.
Um, and then they'll direct you back in for our next panel, which will be the check-in. Yes, and we're going to talk about health and wellness in Central Brooklyn. And you will be surprised that AIDS is number fifth on that list. Anybody want to back up? I'm selling everything.